like to formally welcome uh, Shilpi Kumar, uh, our alumnus from uh, IDC IIT Bombay. And uh, of course, she did some fabulous projects while she was in IDC. And I always tell people that the fabulous project she did was she worked with the craft industry, which is the toughest. And she did a project on an onion organizer in the Indian kitchens. And some from there, uh, you know, the, the Shilpi, uh, you know, uh, uh, is an inquisitive leader, design strategist, use, user experience researcher, industrial designer, and design educator with over 18 years of experience. My God, I'm getting very old now. <laughs> so she was my student here. Before founding her own consulting firm, Coge Lab, uh, she worked with GE Transportation, Digital, and Herman Miller, and where she worked closely with the operations and strategy teams. Uh, to define an integrated business process for new product development and align innovation idea uh, ideas to company strategy human uh, using human centric approach you know that i like that a lot because humanizing technology and human centric is the core uh, to our uh, to large companies businesses right huge money is at stake she specializes in taking an inclusive approach with an eye on bringing together diverse perspectives from people across the organizations uh, this approach helps innovation and strategy teams understand the whole view of innovation, draw on existing organizational strengths, and enable quick adoption of ideas by framing the right question you know, to users, customers, and internal stakeholders. She's able to get to the root of the problem, figure out what next to make or how to reimagine a brand. Most importantly, her expertise lies in prioritizing organizational initiatives to align with where the market is heading and what customers really need. In the, in the most uh, recent 10 years of a corporate experience, she led cost customer experience in a Fortune 500 company, built and grew design research capability, co-led scenario planning in 2012 for a furniture company to define how we'll work through 2018, uh, consulted on various organizational restructuring and transformations, uh, successfully led creation of complete new product development process, uh, integrating innovation to the overall business operations. And she is a researcher, insights manager, employs unique mix method research, design harmonizer, strategist, and of course, you know, capability builder because you have to bring strong teams inside companies to work. So, you know, in short, uh, you know, Shilpi is a phenomenal uh, team, uh, you know, like uh, organizer and team builder and can work in large teams to bring out the best in the teams or to come up with various innovations and you know uh, in fact uh, when i was in chicago in her uh, in her school she studied at i uh, you know uh, institute of chicago design institute chicago where you know she showed me some of the excellent work she did uh, of course it's confidential i don't know how much she'll show you to you today but you know what all she did for the company because the type of operations across the world are phenomenal and when you do that type of operations the level of you know integrity and you know, like empathy to the consumer and, you know, things are phenomenal. You can't forget that to do a large scale operation. So Shilpi brought in all those values into the company. Uh, Shilpi, there we go. Thank you so much uh, for, you know, like uh, agreeing to talk to us and uh, welcome to the class, uh, you know, at IIT Hyderabad uh, for the entrepreneurship skills. So they're going to, you know, we're going to pull a lot of your ideas into our uh, you know vision and plan for you know building our entrepreneurship skills in the courses. Thanks, uh, Chago. I also feel old with that in introduction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you did so much work. It's needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but thank you. I appreciate it, and um, I appreciate the opportunity of talking to the students. I, you know, I I love doing that, and I, it's always an honor to talk to the future leaders. Right. Uh, so my presentation today has a little bit of my story, and then. A little bit more deeper about Coach Lab and you know the premise of the company, what we do, and then uh, I'll show you a short video, which is one of our exploratory works, which is really uh, just researching around the world, uh, asking people that question of you know what is innovation, what is not, uh, what are some of the barriers that companies are facing today to uh, to be innovative at scale, right? You know, when I graduated from IDC, my first job was at a big manufacturing company in Mumbai. Um, and the first project I got was actually design a single drawer unit. So I, I'm an industrial design graduate at IDC. I had an architecture degree before that. 
it was a one page write up saying you know we need a single drawer unit for a call center where you know people can come and put their personal belongings and then take it out and this you know call center is pretty strict in terms of paper and you know because of confidentiality and all of that uh, that was my design brief that was the problem i was asked to solve and it was a big no no to me because you know why why on earth are we trying trying to design a single draw unit who is it for you know what what are they going to do what is the ex overall experience look like and and at that day this was in i would say 2002 um i decided that i want to be the one who writes that one page design brief so that's kind of the premise of where my journey kind of led up to you know doing my second masters uh, in the us at the iit chicago design school is to really help understand what the problem is and framing the problem as a problem not to validate is this a good design for me and it's really about honing into what the problem is and then as a designer i can envision what uh, something you know can be done to solve that problem and then there's other questions that i need to test out like does this work or not or how how is the overall uh, journey for the user so i realized quickly but uh, and when i conveyed that to the company they were very aggressive and they said you know this is it you wanted to i mean i was an intern or a, you know junior student and i was supposed to follow the rules and and do what they and i realized that there's a big disconnect between the business operations and the innovation efforts that go in a company and and we then i thought the design research and strategy is the glue between those two functions um and and that's where my journey started and desire to really learn more and you know experience different uh you know uh ways of thinking about you know business problems that need to be solved so i know throughout the day you focused on the consumer and the idea and the design and here i come with saying oh design is an idea is easy to generate and create what is difficult is how the how we intervene or design in an organization right so it's the operations you know what happens after the design is created and after the idea is created what happens then so so it's about building businesses that build people and uh, you know who have those ideas and and creating that so just a little bit about my journey you know i was an architect and i had this gripe about architecture that architecture is not as human centered as i wanted you know we did build monuments and you know uh, artifacts that uh, are very functional and we talk about function a lot but it's not very empathetic with the user and uh, another gripe i had was there was no structure to a good problem definition how do you really do research to define a problem without sharing my idea right um and that is what leads to a good design brief right knowing what are the all the pain points of the user how is the overall journey of the user how does the solution you're producing fit into the overall social system ecosystem of the person who's using i mean your solution is maybe 5% or 1% of their daily life you know how does that fit into the whole conversation and designers had no voice right as a designer you have no voice in the company uh, and that's what led me to do my second masters which was actually a degree in design methods so the whole idea was it would specialize in design research and design methods and it's really about bringing designerly way of thinking to business so now after that i had the ability to influence leadership uh, designers uh were the biggest asset uh and we we were the voice of the customer with a strong business lens right so it's no more just focus on the idea and the need and the customer but it was really thinking about balancing the business lens with the desirability lens and the and the technology lens right so uh, and that's what you might have commonly heard as mentioned as design thinking right so you know here i move from an architect to an industrial designer to design for livelihood development which uh, chakosar was mentioning i worked 
with an organization called Inbar based out of China, Beijing, um, which was really using design intervention for livelihood development. So I would go into the Himalayan range and actually work with local artisans to uh, help their livelihood by design, you know, through design. Um, and so there also I was actually working like a researcher, ethnographer or an anthropologist sometimes, you know, I have to dress like them, be like them, try to build relationship with them to make sure that they're not feeling that I'm coming from outside and just trying to force them to do things differently. So it was interesting how that, if you think of that as an operations, it was a me mega challenge operations that I had to really break into. Um, and, and today, I think after many years of experience, I would call myself an advocate. I would call myself a futurist, strategist, designer, facilitator, uh, you know, storyteller. I'm not a great designer, actually. Uh, what my strength is being a facilitator or a storyteller or even a futurist um, um, in, the, in the whole gamut of things. So if you think about, I don't know if you're familiar with the squiggly line of innovation where it's like things start from very uncertain, ambiguous, you know, where you don't know what the problem is and you don't know what needs to be designed to, you know, doing all your research methods and kind of design and development and all that. And then you ultimately reach that high certainty and high confidence level. So as designers, that's what we're doing. We're trying to bring more confidence to the, to the idea that, so we uh, you know, apply things like rapid prototyping and testing, right? To make sure that uh, by the time we reach the product, we have already tested it with the consumer. So there's lesser risk of failure. So in my tenure of work, I was mostly at the tail end of beginning of the of the squiggly line. So where things are the most ambiguous, they're most most uncertain, and um, you know the companies don't actually know what they're they're going to do, what the future entails for them. Um, so uh, with that, I actually worked with Herman Miller first uh, for five uh, six years, five years, um, where I was actually at the, it was a team called Insight and Exploration, which is part of the Innovation Kitchen um, in R&D, Herman Miller, where uh, we were basically looking at the future of Herman Miller, you know, as Herman Miller grows, you know, what other things we need to make. So just, just to qualify, Herman Miller is a, is a design-led uh, furniture manufacturer who makes, uh, uh, you know, office furniture, residential furniture, uh, some of the great designers, if you've heard about Charles and Ray Heems, were the initial creative directors uh, over there. And I would say by legacy itself, they were very human-centered in, in their approach. Primarily, so I was hired actually to create a generative um, research capability within Herman Miller, which was trying to define the next you know, five to 10 years of Herman Miller, of where they need to uh, invest in. Um, as of today, Herman Miller is an you know is a holding company. It's actually part of what's called Miller Knoll. Um, they have 19 brands under their umbrella, so it's a huge conglomerate now. Um, it's you know Herman Miller is just one arm within Miller Knoll uh, bracket. Um, so now they're big into retail um, and retail part of the furnishings uh, industry. Uh, and then I uh, did similar work at GE, but um, GE was like a contrast organization from Herman Miller. Herman Miller being a very story-led, qualitative, you know, very human-centered uh, organization. On the other hand, GE, uh, if you know, it's a hundred, it, at that time it was 125 years old company, um, had survived based on their efficient ways and innovation ways, but innovation in terms of invention, right? Like they had so many patents, they made engines and they made many things in our daily life possible, right? Um, so I uh, was part of their customer experience, you know, initiative leader uh, where I was brought in to help their robust research capability as well as uh, understand their operations and uh, say where the disconnect is happening between the customer and the the initial uh, co-development of the products. And here we're talking about complex supply chain, transportation, railroads, 
Um, so it involved going to the rail yards and, you know, talking to these operators and wearing helmets and things like it was, it was a super interesting role, but um, it, we were part of the, the innovation silo. And that's a common phenomenon, when, especially when there are big companies involved. So, um, and the, a lot of the research I did internal was internal, uh, trying to figure out how uh, we can streamline how our ideas kind of go into the organization. And that's where I got really interested in this idea of uh, trying to find the disconnects and diagnosis uh, almost of an organization, how we can make you know, the ideas flow um, better in the organization. When GE was my last uh, corporate job and I realized that it's actually nobody's job to look at things across different functions. Um, and, and that's when I started this uh, whole organization called Coach Lab, which is a global innovation consultancy. So six, since 2018, we have been you know, we are a set of multicultural, multilingual uh, women. Most consultants are women. Um, and we partner with, uh, you know, consultants across and even organizations um, to improve their business value with a human-centered approach. So think about how you can operate a business with a more human-centered lens. It's not about the idea here, right? So here I'm saying, okay, use your same kind of, method of empathy and research and apply it into the organization of how you engage with stakeholders internally, right? Um, and it, it, this is not applicable just for designers. It's all of these product managers, researchers, designers, engineers, all of these, uh, you know, functions within the organization. We are focused on innovation performance. So it's really important for us to be, um, to employ lean methods uh, within the organization so that uh, there's uh, not much wastage. Um, so if you know, there's a lot of research. I mean, companies spend a lot of millions of dollars in research, but a lot of it is just sitting in the shelves and not being leveraged. Uh, just like a lot of the ideas are sitting on the shelf and not being implemented, right? So so our focus is really about uh, you know, performance of innovation, like how can we make the intervention of design better uh, and uh, much more effective. Um, so we actually have a suite of knowledge and consulting services that uh, help with that innovation flow within the company. So we focus a lot of value of design in business um, to bring clarity and focus. So that's our uh, mission and vision. And so we do that in three ways. Uh, we, we look at client work. We do a lot of engagements with big corporations. Um, big corporations or mid-sized organizations that are trying to redefine or transform themselves to different way of working, um, or they're just trying to scale up you know, their efforts in terms of ideating or bringing new ideas to the, to the industry. But almost 45% of our work is client work. You know, we do 5% pro bono work. So every year we adopt a company, a nonprofit or, um, you know, organization that is doing great social impact. And we adopt that firm and help them with free services. And then we also uh, engage in uh, learning and building um, you know, new knowledge. So we use all our client work and the pro bono work to actually learn and derive frameworks. So if you remember, I mentioned my degrees in design methods. We're all about methods and frameworks to make bring more structure to how we think about design and research and, and operations even. So we, um, we actually do a lot of work on thought leadership um, and it's something we are, I'm passionate about and uh, we partner with uh, design agencies and other, you know, we uh, recruit a lot of interns. In fact, we, uh, uh, you know, two students at IDC also interned with, with us uh, last summer and they did some great work. Um, and I'll show you one piece uh, as an outcome of that work, some of that work in a form of a six minute video that we created as, as thought leadership about what we had learned about what's not innovation, and I'll, I'll share that with you. So we are basically um, unique in our ability to bring operational view to innovation, as you know, and you probably feel it. Uh, designers don't like the operation stuff. They say, I just want to create new ideas, have fun with that. I, 
I don't want to deal with the operation stuff, right? So I'm kind of counter to that. I love operations. I love processes. Uh, and that's where I think is the key next opportunity for human-centered design um, in the operations of uh, making businesses more um, capable of innovating at scale. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the true value of design is in the, in the intersection of people, technology, and the business. Um, so that balance is what we, we really work with. Uh, we have a lot of frameworks that actually help you think uh, and take all these lenses when you're thinking about the customer journey and the solution that you're trying to produce. So we try to make sure that we work with the right stakeholders in the organization to bridge that gap. So it's really important even when you're doing a startup idea or something that's coming out in the world that you early on, you're thinking about not just people and desirability, but also thinking about business or how is it going to be marketed? How is it going to be sold? What does the distribution channel look like? What is the business model, right? So now you cannot do that without balancing these three different circles. And if, I mean, now it's there's a three more circles that you can add to it, which is about inclusiveness, just and what is sustainable in to the environment, right? So it's not only just, oh, is it desirable by the people? Is it is it viable to make it? You know, can you make it? Even does the technology exist? Or is it actually profitable for the business to make? But now you're thinking, okay, is it good for the environment? Is it good for the overall social impact on the world? Like, how is it going to change behavior, right? I don't know if you've read that book. Uh, it was a very influential book for me uh, by Victor Papanik, uh, Design the Real World. And he talks about how socially responsible businesses need to be when they think about design. So we have bucketed our offerings into three big buckets. So problem framing, I think that's one of our strengths. Um, and then insight-led innovation and then institutionalizing innovation and think about thinking about you know, how innovation is actually structured in the, in the businesses. So below are lists of some of the methods and you know, things that we do uh, to work with organizations uh, for, to help them in these. Um, in the end, we are interested in people, mindsets, and values, and we do that through creative communication, storytelling, relationship management, alignment, and rigor. And I would say design methods are really key to bringing alignment across the organization. So think about that you're uh, showcasing the experience that the users have with your solution or an idea across the lens of the business, technology, and the user, right? That's so wonderful, right? That's a way to align uh, the whole team. So, um, so like I said, I'm interested in showing business leaders how ideas can flow seamlessly uh, through the organization to all the way to their customers, right? So that's been my goal in in with my profession and career, um, and that's uh, our strength as well. Um, so I have a Medium blog, which I would encourage you guys to read um, and uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, just to give you an overview and a disclaimer that I have worked with a lot of large corporations. So a lot of the stories I talk about are related to the challenges of being a big company. Um, uh, in a smaller company or a newer company like uh, WeWork or uh, some of the newer companies, I think it's an you know, it's it's um, less challenging. It has other challenges, but these challenges are less because they're newer people and the, they're newer ways. They're employing newer ways of thinking and working. But in large legacy companies, there are some really old traditional ways that need to be broken down to bring this new way of thinking in it. So, and we work across industries, so we don't care really. It's retail or healthcare or furniture or others. We've worked in good mix of uh, you know come kind of companies um, across the globe. Um, so I, just for to break the rhythm of me talking, I'm gonna share uh, one of the exploratory knowledge thought leadership pieces with you guys. Just to give a little premise, I interviewed a lot of people. In fact, Chakosar also I interviewed for, for this project. And we, um, we thought we were trying to understand what innovation is. But when we synthesized all our interviews, we realized that 
it's really not about what innovation is. Innovation can mean different things to different people. But what we quickly realized is what is not innovation. And, and that's what became the narrative is, uh, you know, how can we bust these myths and detangle them uh, for an organization? So Im imagine an organization thinking that they're being innovative, but actually that's not innovation. It's something else, you know? Um, and that's a big problem, right? It's a big challenge when you're uh, thinking, oh, you're being so innovative, you're, you're doing a lot of innovation, but actually that's not innovation, that's something else. Sounds good? Myths of innovation. What is the most tossed word globally today? What seems to be everyone's mantra? Innovation. There are very definitions based on people, places, and perceptions. Three decades after liberalization, Indian companies are still chasing the innovation dream. Over 70% CEOs in India want their employees to feel empowered to innovate. Yet, innovation is still ranked as one of the biggest challenges today. Is it because we really aren't innovative? Is there a problem in our understanding? Why is it so? We at Koj Lab set to find out what is innovation? We searched, we researched, we reached out to thought leaders, designers, academicians, growth officers, and we arrived at what is not innovation. From this research, we present seven myths of innovation that are entangling us. Myth one, innovation is that one bright idea. This is the most common myth. The problem is romancing the idea as a solution with little thought about its movement through the organization. It is important to synchronize the idea and manage with your stakeholders as it evolves. The idea is the seed, only 5-10% to 10 of the whole thing. Very important, but it needs to be nurtured. Lesson is, map the flow of an idea and streamline it. Myth 2. Innovation is to fight competition. Successful companies focus on genuine improvement. They don't innovate to fight competition. Kodraj understands to sustain growth, innovation is imperative. Being innovative means evolution with times, knowledge of future needs and customer value. The real goal is to keep looking for opportunities, thereby beating competition is a byproduct of being consistently innovative. Myth 3. Digital transformation is innovation. Most digital transformation projects start with new technology migration without engaging in experimentation or exploration. However, innovation is about identifying problems and finding new ways to solve them. Technology may be an enabler for solving problems, but it's not the only solution. Digital transformation is creating the illusion that you are protected. Point is, don't just migrate, explore and improve. Myth 4. Innovation is expensive. There is a common perception that only large companies have the luxury to innovate. Truth is, the majority of big innovations started cheap, quick and affordable, irrespective of the company size. Let's look at PillPack. Within five years, they have grown into a unicorn. Not a single component of PillPack's products and services is new to the industry. Yet, the secret is that they identified a simple human need and aligned the system to make business sense. Key is to identify what to pause and what to invest in. Myth 5. Innovation has immediate return on investment. The way our business mind thinks, we set a goal, plan, define the resources, set KPIs and measure progress. But innovation needs small experiments and sometimes experiments fail. Key is to take returns from present and invest them in the future. The return on innovation investment may not be visible immediately. It is not a financial statement you put at the end of the year. In short, experiment, fail, reallocate, reap. Myth 6. Innovation is a one-time act. With advances in technology, any disruptions will stay relevant for a short period. Companies need to envision the future with users' relevance in perspective. All innovations have a limited era of impact. How can an organization be continuously innovating, improving and reinventing itself? That's the holy grail. 
So innovate small and repeat. Myth seven: Innovation is a natural phenomenon. Introducing focused team activities and innovation champions is essential. It cannot be a phenomenon of natural progression. Innovation is a forced activity. You need to have active players, and you need to change the mindsets of the systems to make it happen. Don't just wait. Orchestrate the magic. These myths lead to some significant barriers that hamper the success of large corporations in India. The Indian mindset is risk averse, which leads to a copycat culture. It romances the past and takes pride in jugaad. All of these present challenges to embracing new ways of doing business. Now let's ask again: What is innovation? Innovation is to address a need that brings value to the world. It is systematic orchestration of mindsets and activities. It can happen at any scale, small or big, low risk or high risk, incremental or disruptive. The result is not always totally new. Put simply, not everyone needs to innovate, but with the right tools and processes, anyone can innovate. We are on a journey to explore, inform, and impact the innovation landscape in India. Let's join hands. Uh, yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation and the video. Uh, my question was like uh, the the jugard mindset or the copy paste mindset is very well known. Like uh, even in the industries, like when you're working with people as well, uh, everyone is more into that. Okay, you can just copy this template. Why are you spending the whole time in doing the whole research and design process? So um, how do you get past that, and how do you? Uh, Like show the importance of going through the whole process and innovate. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I I think it's a tough one, and I think it starts from the leadership and the mindset that they're in. And I think it's really about the, changing that business aspiration of where the business wants to be. If they want to be a fast follower, nobody can stop them from copying a, a technology or an idea and just. changing like small thing about it and and launching it right but i think if the business aspiration is to be disruptive and to be the first mover um i think that has to change first um and then obviously we have you know you have methods to really come up with so such uh, such ideas so that and and one of the the ways is to actually redefine reframe the problem so if you know a good example is the mp3 player right everyone every organization was coming up with the mp3 players the samsung and all these and apple could have done the same thing but what they did is we they really looked at okay what is the mp3 player doing what is the problem it's solving and they said okay it's about listening to the music but it's also about enjoying and sharing music so the, what they did is they reframed the problem of listening to music to enjoying and sharing music and they created itunes right so that was the disruption not the ipod um and 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 so businesses have to learn how to first they have to desire to be disruptive or or new not to, not necessarily always disruptive it can, they can just be new and and unique right but then they have to know how to do that so a capability gap is also often a problem where they want to do disruptive but they don't know how to do it how to approach it so very nice yeah Thank awesome you. questions i'm enjoying this <laughs> great presentation first of all um i wanted to know actually um how uh, do you tackle the language barrier if that has been an issue uh, at some point of time and uh, also how uh, the second question is how do you decide which approach to take for analysis of interviews and the sessions and workshops that you've conducted yeah those are the two questions the two big questions so one is the language barrier so are you talking about the literal language barrier like five languages at the workplace uh i was talking in reference to conducting interviews say if you're going into oh. and uh, you're not familiar with the language but they uh. establish or uh, so the right so there are two types of language barriers one is really literally the language barrier right so we overcome that by hiring translators so we just go with translators and and do it we just conducted a, a seven country study where we had japan 
Hong Kong, Brazil, Mexico. So we hired translators and and we just uh, did the conducted and we had made sure that the digital platforms that we were using for the ethnography, uh, which because of COVID we couldn't do in person. So we used a digital ethnography tool and we just chose the platform uh, to ensure by ensuring that it does take language, you know, different languages and, and stuff. So they could uh, translate it in Japanese and then you could, you know, uh, which approach? How do you decide which approach? Ah, this that's a that's okay. That's my master's degree, by the way. That's design methods. That's um, <laughs> so. But in a simplistic way, I start with the primary objective. You know, primary objective of the 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 project that you're dwelling into. Then we look at secondary and tertiary objectives as well. And then tied to that objective, I always have research questions. So these are not the questions I'm going to ask the people. These are questions that I'm trying to learn or answer, right, for the stakeholders. So say listing, you know, five to 10 questions, or it doesn't matter how many, but, and then tied to each question or set of questions, I categorize the questions in terms of the method. So I always like two, three different methods for different studies because I feel like it's a combination of analytical thinking and intuition, right? You cannot forget, I mean, we're designers and even research has a lot of intuition and creativity in it. So I to totally believe that a new method will lead you to different inspirational ideas. So uh, that's a key. So I think it's really about what questions you're trying to learn and what's the best method to achieve, uh, answer those questions. So it's a really structured approach that uh, we take. And it's, uh, um, I'm, yeah, I think you can probably IDC has a whole class on it. I don't know, but it's a, it's a whole uh, process that, uh, but the best simply, simply to describe it is these three steps. You know, you write your objective, your research questions, and then say, okay, how am I gonna answer this question? Maybe we do, some expert interviews to learn about that or do secondary research, desk research to do that or do ethnography, follow alongs or in-home study, you know, so it's a, it's a combination of that. Could you recommend some programs or uh, just um, habits to develop to become a better qualitative interviewer? Again, that's a whole class we can, we can talk about, but I think some simple rules are Never ask a do question or a why question. Like it's avoid that because when you ask, do you do this? It's like kind of assuming and leading, you know? Um, when you ask why, it sounds judgmental. Like, why do you do this? I mean, you never ask those questions. And then also use a like a funneling kind of approach where you warm up. It's it's almost like if you listen to radio jockeys, right? Like a lot of them do interviews and it's an interesting way of how they build relationship, you know, warm up the thing, get comfortable because the, the biggest insights come towards the end of the interview, always. It takes, like even you guys, look at it. First question came after two minutes. Now you get pouring questions, right? Like you build that rapport with me. So it's about building rapport, making the interviewee very comfortable uh, with and trust. You know, there's a trust building thing to happen. So I think the interpersonal skills are really important and, you know, being a good listener and probing at the right time is very important. So they're key uh, methods that you use and the way we prepare for an interview and what probes we prepare and you know how we even set up you know how we recruit and set up who we're interviewing and how we set expectations with that person um, is also very important. Um, so just as a side note, uh, like you can go on our website and the narrative section and you'll find a lot of this information, but we actually ended up creating a lot of uh, cards, action cards for each myth, you know, you know, what is the kind of call to action and then uh, what are the things you can do actually to mitigate this, this myth. Um, so, I mean, there are many of that. Um, so this is our small crew. It's a ever growing and expanding kind of a team. Um, so there are many contractors beyond these that we leverage to do our projects. And we have Studio Vitamin D actually as a design partner. So they work on our creative work. So Ashwin, he's a graduate of IDC as well. And um, he actually and his team actually created the animation that you saw. We are on socials. So uh, please go and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, we would love to grow our community and, you know, share. So we promised ourselves in, you know, last uh, October 
where we started our social presence that we are going to focus on just thought leadership. So no marketing gimmick and all of that. We're just going to focus on sharing our frameworks and knowledge. So if you're interested in the things that I said today, uh, you will get a lot of that from our social. So. so fabulous, uh, Shilpi. It's wonderful to see how your methods yeah. are very interesting. No, So wonderful. And uh, Shilpi, we like your name a lot, the you know, Coach Lab. It resonates with all the Indians quite a bit. <laughs> I don't know how the other people see it, but it's fabulous. And, you know, like all the best and, you know, wonderful presentation and very good uh, narrative. And thank you so much. And, you know, the, and all the best. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like uh, we'll catch up again. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Enjoy.